uh, energy systems. So you're in the energy systems area of uh, engineering. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the work we do, and the academic staff we're presenting will provide a bit more detail on what, what we do in, in their, their particular specialisms. So first of all, a bit of context, the School of Engineering. Engineering has been in Edinburgh for almost 150 years, um, but in various forms. It was brought together in 2002 as one single school. Before that, it was separate departments, which is what it's like at Strathclyde at the moment. Uh, but we brought it together as one general school. Um, we have uh, over 150 staff, uh, 350 P PhD students, MSc students, and, and 1,400 undergraduates. The teaching is taught within disciplines, but we have research institutes, and there are six research institutes, some of which are very focused on electrical, electronic, but some which are very multidisciplinary. So ours, Energy Systems, is probably the most multidisciplinary of all. So we have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, mathematicians, chemical engineers. Uh, we have an applied economist in there as well. Um, so it's a very um, diverse set of skills we have, and that's what you need for, for energy, and energy systems. But we work closely with other institutes like, oh yes, it does work. So we work closely with digital communications on smart grids. We work with infrastructure environments and on water engineering and environment. Um, and we work with materials and processes on, on um, use of materials in, in, in energy systems. So there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, overlap and, and collaboration between the institutes. So within energy systems, we focus very much on low and zero carbon production of energy. Uh, we work on, on the distribution of energy of, that, of those sources uh, um, from, the, from the source all the way to the, the, the end user. And we work a lot with, with industry um, and, and governments, Scottish governments, um, UK government, European governments, to inform on policy. So we've got about 26 academic staff, 25 research staff, and over 70 PhD students, not including the ID core, core students. And all that is funded with about... Uh, 20 million pounds in the last five years from ver various organisations, um, just just like at Strathclyde, um, uh, we have to go for all the different funding bodies, and then and we work work with similar funding bodies as, as, as they do at Strathclyde. So to give you a flavour for uh, some of the work we do, um, the renewables challenge is very much uh, look at look at the resources. You need to understand the resources. This shows the wave resource off the northwest coast of Scotland. You need to know the the, the resource. You need to, be able to measure it. You need to, be able to model it. You need to understand how to interact with that resource to capture the energy. So you need to understand um, the types of devices, whether it's a wave device, tidal device, or a wind device. Once you've captured it, and so you, once you've understood the hydrodynamic, uh, uh, mod, hydrodynamic um, interaction between the device and the resource, you need to then convert that into um, mechanical energy into, into a form of electrical energy. So we have work on machines, and then you have to deliver that to the grid um, so you need some sort of power conversion in there to deliver the grid, and you, then you need to control the look at what happens on the grid side um, to to, um, to integrate the renewables with seamlessly, so you're satisfying all, all grid rules. And so these are the main challenges here. And so as a result of that, we have a number of groupings within the institutes to meet those challenges. So we have an energy and climate change group headed by Gareth Harrison. So he's going to say something a bit later. Offshore renewables on marine and wind energy. We have a number of people who work in that area, and you'll, some of them uh, are presenting. And the machines, power electronics, again, that machines is my main area, and you'll learn more about that later. And then over on the delivery side, power systems, smart grids, energy storage, and, and carbon capture and storage. And over all of that, we also have a policy group within the engineering, within the Institute for Energy Systems, um, uh, and, and so a little bit more about that. Um, and that's really working on road mapping and informing um, governments and, and around the world on their technology programs for, for marine energy. So here's a flavour for some of the things that we do. So in climate change energy systems, so Gareth's interested in, in what impact a uh, rise in temperature is going to have on the network in, in 30 or 40, 50 years, um, what impact it might have on solar resource, where you're therefore going to um, install your solar panels in the future, likewise with wind. And so a lot of it is all forecasting and modelling, but using um, uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, weather data and forecasting data to do that. So we work a lot on that. I'm sure Gareth will say more later. Resource analysis. Um, we do a lot of uh, modelling. This shows the, the, the shallow water model for the um, Pentland Firth, the north, north coast of Scotland. Um, so we, 
there's a whole, there's a very large array due to go in there um, called the Magen array. Um, over the next 10 years, is planned about over 300 megawatts. The next four or five years, will be about six megawatts, uh, six devices going in here, yeah, about six megawatts. And this is a model um, developers need to understand the, the, the strength of the array, strength of the resource, so they uh, can can choose the best location. They don't want to put in the most most powerful area because obviously that could damage the machines if they're not designed. So they're choosing choosing a section here in the inner sound, um, and this model shows the resource, including the the, the major end tidal turbine in that inner sound. So we do models of models of that. Um, but we also also do is we, we use GIS tools, and again this is work that Gareth and David get involved in, is m mapping the resource all the way around the UK coast for uh, wave resource, tidal resource, offshore wind, onshore wind. But we also look at the bathymetry of the seabed. We look at the grid connection points. We look where the, the ports are. So there's a series of layers of lots and lots of different um, different bits of data in there. So that you, if you're a developer or, or, or someone who's who's do, doing research in there, you can find where the best sites are and, and use it for, for, for sort of techno-economic type modeling. Marine energy testing, so you'll see some of the test facilities and, and David will say more about those, those later, so I won't say too much about that. Um, but we also do field measurements, um, so we do a lot of modeling work, testing in tanks, but one of our colleagues, Brian Seller, who I saw at lunch, is not in here, uh, has been, and Duncan Sutherland um, spent uh, uh, almost a year measuring tidal data up at EMEC, and this is the, Al the nacelle of the Alstom turbine, and this is, these are a number of um, acoustic Doppler uh, velocity measurement systems which they um, and then designed and installed on, on top of the, the turbine and have a year's worth of resource data which they can map, map, align with um, loading data on the turbine as well. Um, and this data is, is going to be made publicly available um, on the UK, NC UK ERC energy research database. Um, CFD modelling, um, and so Angus Creech, who's presenting later, works heavily on CFD modelling, um, but we, this just shows some pictures, this is offshore wind farm, um, so you can see the interaction due to wakes, wake effects and what's happening behind the, the front row of the turbines, and he's extended this work into tidal, uh, tidal devices as well, and I'm sure he's going to show you more, more, more stuff on that later. Electrical power conversion. So the, the first bit was resource modeling and interaction with the, with resource. Now we're looking at um, how you then convert that. And so this is not my area. We work very much in the electric generated power conversion side, but you need to understand the, the, what the characteristics of the prime mover, but you also need to understand what's happening in the grid. So it's very much the bridge between the two. Um, and I'll, and more will be said later on. Power networks, smart grids, so once you've converted electricity, you've got to then get delivered to the grid, but you know, as you know, a lot of the resource is up here, or in the north coast of Scotland, and a lot of the load centres are down in the Midlands, or the central belt here, Midlands, and down in the southeast. so you've got to get that um, power down there somehow, so it's, it's how you integrate those renewables into the grid, and that links very much into the, the, some of the power electronics we've been doing on the HVDC systems that you might have um, going down, down here. I'm going through quickly. Energy storage is a big uh, is a big hot topic at the moment, and um, this this Daniel Friedman will, will say more about this. But this is one of his slides and shows that electricity is not just the main issue. It's um, heat and, and transport, and heat is, is, is significant. And the Scottish government has changed its policy now, and, not, and it's not just about electricity uh, getting generating uh, electricity from renewables. It's also understanding how you can produce heat from renewables and, and, and reducing the, the carbon emissions in, in heat. And so he'll talk more about um, thermal energy storage uh, in his presentation as well. But here's some work we're doing by, uh, that Adam Robinson's doing, is looking at very high, uh, thermal, high, very high temperature thermal energy storage for grid connection. And he's come up with a technology, which I can't really say much more about, but, but what he's shown here is the Kraken power station, so this, this whole here, area here, and his technology will um, produce the same amount of energy storage as the Kraken power station, but rather than a big lake in a mountain, you just have this uh, little red dot here. Okay, so if his technology can, can be realised and can work at very high temperatures, and we're talking 1,000 degrees C plus, then you can replace a, a, a small a hydropower station like this with a, with, a, with a small plant down there. It'll so it's a very exciting work. It. Sorry? It'll be blue. It's very hot. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that'll right. be blue. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it'll be changing colours as it goes as the load goes up and down. Steve, so. 
Um, it, as I said, we do work on innovation and policy, and we work very close in the past with the UK Energy Research Centre. Uh, a lot of the work that Henry Jeffrey does, and Henry's not here, but Laura will present on, on his behalf, is, is looking at um, cost of energy, looking at road mapping, and we um, worked with um, the American um, Department of Energy, with Canadian equivalent, with UK, Scottish governments, um, Europeans, New Zealand, Chile, uh, to help them develop their own roadmaps. Um, so it's all about having involved policy work there. And this is an example of the work he's done um, with the Chilean government, which led to a Marine Energy Research Innovation Centre established two years ago. So, so he went out there, um, helped them understand what, what they've got in terms of their, their resource, in terms of the, the, the physical resource, but also the, the human resource. And, and based on what they've got, they then develop a plan in order to develop marine energy. We also work on CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage. So the Edinburgh University hosts the UK Centre for Carbon Capture and Storage. Um, and our colleagues Hannah and Mathieu uh, uh, work in this particular area. Um, and and it's, it's not just about the, the storage area, it's all how the, the storage plant interacts with wind, interacts with renewables, um, and is developing the technology to do that. So... As part of that, it's including uh, uh, biomass uh, as well. So it's, it's, it's introducing biomass into the, into the system. And finally, we have a, a small group which has just been started the last couple of years on clean combustion and the IC engine. And it's all about trying to improve the fuel efficiency by um, controlling the spray of the fuel into the chamber much more um, effectively. And what I didn't really understand was that, that in most engines, the engine manufacturer gets this control system, it's just a black box. And they really do not understand how you can control, how you control the spray. If you control the spray going into the, into the chamber, um, you can actually improve the fuel efficiency by 20 to 30 percent. And that's but, but it's a very difficult thing to do. So we've got a, a group working on that now. So that's all I want to say. Um, this production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.